Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We've been making cheese in Wisconsin since before we were even a state, which may be one reason why we win so many awards for it. It's what happens when a whole state dreams in cheese. Find your next favorite cheese at (laughs) wisconsincheese.com. Hey, hey, welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. It's Tuesday, January 24th, 2023. This is our 14th season. Uh, really proud to be uh, here every week on Heritage Radio Network. Our roots go back to uh, Roberta's Pizza and the studio in, in Bushwick, Brooklyn. So, um, well, I'm Jimmy Carboni, and we're going to be talking about uh, mezcals and the world of spirits, but in particular, the bowl is old. Pozzoli and Mezcal Festival uh, with one of the founders, um, Arik Torrent. Arik, how are you, sir? To say a few words uh, for our listeners so they can hear your voice. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Arik, Arik Torrent. And uh, Jimmy, I really appreciate you uh, inviting me onto the program. Yeah. You know, so yesterday I was at a really cool uh, spirits and beer tasting at, at As Is in the West Side in Manhattan. Um, and it made me just realize just how many talented uh, industry professionals there are in the city from bartenders, uh, beverage managers, um, and on up. And, and, you know, I, I still love to go out to a good bar or restaurant and, and taste my beers and, and drinks and have a good cocktail. So, you know, Rx got, to me, he's a legend in the industry. He's an expert in beverages. And, uh, let, let's just, let's talk about you. It, we, hopefully also we can inspire, you know, uh, the next generation who's, Who's coming up? Because there's a lot of professionalism in our industry. Um, it's come a long way in the last 30 years since I started. So, all right, let's, let's go back to the early days. So, I know you 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 were part of opening a restaurant. You you've you've got beverage manager experience. Um, how did you get into that? Well, I think like a lot of people, I found hospitality because typical education just wasn't where I was finding myself. It wasn't where I was clicking. Uh, But, you know, going to college um, and just working in the restaurant business, I think I actually really started as a cater waiter at my local temple, Temple Shalom. Shout out to Temple Shalom. Uh, And, uh, you know, we were doing like three weddings a weekend, bar mitzvahs and brises. And, you know, kind of the whole energy of it was really just part of the DNA at that point. And uh, after college, I moved to Aspen and really kind of saw what it was like from there to um, see really passionate chefs, amazing food, cool service, enthusiastic clientele, and uh, all while snowboarding a lot. <laughs> so you, you definitely got fell in love with the lifestyle, right? It was, it was, you know, and I think that's not uncommon. And it, and then it became more, uh, you know, it just continued on to be more than that. Um, I want, always wanted to open a restaurant as an owner. 
Um, but I never had the opportunity to do that. I couldn't figure put put those uh, put those uh, ducks in a row. But I've done a lot. I've done quite a few openings, uh, and you know, uh, and spent and really um, been in a lot of places in the front of the house of the restaurant business. Uh, I was more like you know a chef admirer, you know, but I never worked in the kitchen. You know, you're you're an important part of any operation. You know that. You're always like, why is this place running so well? Uh, there's a good manager. <laughs> you know, I, I did you open uh, Mermaid Inn, which 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 was a great place in the East Village, and I know it's going to get reopened. Still now. is. It's still there. Yep, yep, yep. Well, the whole company is still amazing, and I think I've heard that they are going to reopen in that original location. But uh, when I left New York, it was closed. Um, yep, I. I I came back from New York, started, I think all in all, I've done like 14 or 15, you know, openings in, in, in some part of the team. Uh, I started working uh, at the, the Red Cat as a bartender. Uh, the GM at the time was an Aspen guy, so it all clicked in. And then that's when I met, uh, uh, you know, so I worked for Jimmy Bradley and Danny Abrams. And they just had a really beautiful thing going with that restaurant. I left that group uh, to do work with Sushi Samba for a few years, including 9-11 and all that, you know, complications and, and, and trauma. Uh, and then uh, went back with them to open up that, uh, that, that first mermaid in 2003, which was an amazing experience. And, 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 and actually, I was very fortunate in all of these um, people I worked for along the way, Campo de Fury in Aspen, Red Cat, Sushi Samba. And they really shaped like my knowledge of, of, uh, of this industry and, and you know, how to get things done and learn from good people and see things that you want to lean towards and run away from and all those kind of things. So when did you become more involved with beverages? Were, were you a beverage manager or a buyer at any of these restaurants? I, yeah, I, I, I took, I, I was sort of the back of the house head bartender at Campo de Fury in Aspen before I had left there. So I was doing the purchasing uh, and kind of running, making the limoncello, the homemade in-house stuff and, Really, that's when I was like really getting the bug, you know, as a bartender. And then was bartending in New York uh, when I moved back to the Red Cat. And then I I moved on to Sushi Samba, where I wasn't really handling the beverage program at the time, but I knew that's where I wanted to go. And then when I started at at, at the Red at, at the Mermaid, I was the GM. And I also was studying and got certified as a sommelier, not to work in that type of role, but to be a better educator, to be able to really be more well-rounded, to, 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 to start and finish a wine list and maintain it and do all the things that's needed. But never, uh, I've never done like the fine dining sommelier thing. That was never my yeah my track. I, I, I took, I think I took the same class uh, about thirty years ago. Was it the Sommelier Society of America? They had a sommelier. It wasn't. No, I no? took uh, American American Sommelier Association, the ASA. So I did a couple of levels of training in that. Uh, it was really helpful, wasn't it? Amazing, ama amazing. You know, I was. You know, I was also at the Mermaid. We were we had this very minimal list. It was very cool. We got a good amount of press on it. We were very. It was right after a recession, or kind of opened at, on the recession, and we took this approach of like ten whites, ten reds, a couple of wines by the glass, everything fifteen dollars above cost. So how do you be? You know, so we were offering this great value. Uh, and how do you become interesting with such a small list? So because I was I was taking those classes and I was very active, I was working with great distribution partners. That was another thing that you get to learn, like who and great distributor reps and finding out who's going to give you good ideas and good opportunities and uh, within either short run items or discounts. And we were doing a lot of that. That that wine that wine list 
was changing a lot. And we did it in a, in a way that made it, that allowed it to work every day during that lineup session. We would open wine. We'd talk about wine in addition to the food. It was equally as important. And while, you know, I, there was a lot of, well, basically our staff in a short period of time became wine experts on our wine menu, totally competent and just able to rock it out. And that was something that I kind of learned through that process of taking the time and putting the work into it and really seeing it through to, to the team that you're working with. Uh, then all of a sudden it becomes easy, you know, especially if you're able to, we, we didn't have a lot of staff turnover. It was a good place to work. So that was all, all those stars were aligned. You know, glad you mentioned distributors. I think especially in my experience in New York City, the, that also is what drew me into the industry was meeting the, the really knowledgeable, you know, very, very talented people that are selling beer, wine, spirits in, in New York City. Mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite from those early days you want to call out to? Because I, I I've got a list of of oh. favorite distributor reps um, that I'm still friends with. Oh, uh, yeah, Dan Lerner, legend from Skernick. Uh From those days, gosh, I'm, I'm. You know what? Let let let's talk about this guy. Since you know, we should talk about beer. <laughs> this right now, we're kind of talking hospitality to start. Um, Dan Lerner was the first rep I ever got to know about 30 years ago. Uh, at the time, he worked for Skernick Wines. I'm so which, glad you know him. Which has a great You're portfolio, lucky. including of spirits and mezcal. But uh, at the time, I, I read this book, Kermit Lynch, Adventures on the Wine Route. I probably haven't mentioned that in several years. But that's really what made me interested. You know, talking about education, when, when I read Kermit Lynch's Adventures on the Wine Route, I realized that there was a smart, literate, <laughs> um, you know, very interesting side of, of restaurants and bars. And then, lo and behold, Dan Lerner is was the rep selling a Kermit Lynch for Skernick wines. <laughs> so I would say the first five yes. or six years, he was kind of my my guru for really getting the. He inspired me and made me really want to do more in the industry. Um, so same, thumbs up absolutely. To him. And, and there were others too, and I wish I could remember their names. I apologize to 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 them all for not remembering. But yeah, the I, I to the point of the reps and great distribution will find great products and connect you with great ambassadors that great sales reps, uh, they're invaluable. So if you're kind of coming up, like seek them out, seek seek the guidance of uh, those folks with, with their knowledge of their book and knowledge of, you know, the difficulties of being in a restaurant and some folks can really connect dots, uh, in, 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 beautiful ways yeah no i think I, we always take it for granted in new york city that there's so many good reps um but we you know go into our our event bowl is all um when we we went to boston last year for the first time and we really got connected in that in that city through our reps didn't we absolutely yeah uh so yeah shout out to bowl is all uh and then i mean really that all, it all happened because of you, Jimmy, you know, we, uh, we have this idea, but kind of didn't know how to make it a reality. And you're the man that made it a reality for us. And we, uh, with Danny Mena, and we started that event. Uh, and we, we eventually brought it to Boston and through my relationship with the distribution company with Burke was my distributor, uh, for that market. And Danny's distributor at MS Walker, and then through other distributor relation re, re, distributors that got involved, including Berkshire and I'm sure some others, uh, we were able to, you know, it, 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 they're connectors. They're they're doing sales, but if you do it with passion, they're doing it in a way that is is really deep, where they're connecting people, they're connecting products. And in this case, they were connecting us to venues and restaurants and and um, and secondary kind of supply needs and all those kind of things. So, yeah, I think um, the distributors has always been the unsung hero. People always talk about the, you know, rock star restaurants and sommeliers and bartenders and 
rock star brands that are the coolest things or amazing producers. We love, I, you know, passionate about all of that. But I don't think, I think to your point, we're not, we're, we often leave out the distributor. And they are like, for, for small brands like myself, for small suppliers, uh, they're our ambassadors. They're our boots on the ground. You know, we get to go to a market and do a visit in Boston or New York, where I no longer live anymore, uh, or anywhere else for like once a year, if we're lucky. You know, so who's representing these amazing producers, these amazing brands? Uh, every other day, it's the distributors, you know. Yeah, so, no, that's that, that's a great them. talking point because we're gonna we're gonna go back and talk more about that. So let's let's go back to you. So um, you you also became a an importer of of mezcals and spirits, mm-hmm. and you've really that's what you've made your career at, and you're you are a true expert. I just wanted people to realize that you you did come up through the industry and. You know, you you really know all, all the ins and outs of restaurants and bars, but it, you know, it, with mezcal, let, let's do our mezcal and and agave spirits one hundred and one. I mean, for, from working with you, Arik, I learned that there's mezcal and that there's still really good authentic tequila. That's that's not just okay, but but outstanding. And there's there's other types of these spirits like sotal and Racia. Mm-hmm. Um, g- give us the primer, yes. like. I mean, there's no way you can talk about all of them, but um, shed a light because I, I do know that um, we've got a lot to talk about. So, so, so t- give me the primer because I, I I still don't know enough. I guess I guess the this well, Mexico is amazing. They have it's the epicenter of the agave plant. They have this uninterrupted um, history culture of individuals working with the agave plant for fermentation and distillation. Uh, so you have this plant that has amazing complexity. Uh, there's much it, astronomically higher levels of uh, complex flavor adding uh, compounds in the plant that lead to a very, very complex unaged spirit, like a clear spirit, which it really, what, when you think of whiskeys or corn, corn or rye or all these amazing spirits that come out of it, they really reach their 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 interesting place with with within the barrel. But agave spirits have uh, they do cool things in the barrels, but they really uh, can shine without it. And then you have this uninterrupted culture or or history. So we have this national expertise that shows terroir, that shows individual creativity, that shows history it shows spirituality and shows and you know cleverness uh and flavor so that's something you know i always say like imagine if you know our original distillers back in the day and 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 the, the people around them and who they would have touched over the centuries if they were never prevented from you know doing distillation in their backyard what would our wisdom be here in the united states it would be just massively deeper and they have that there so mexico is just an incredible place for wealth of talent and resource so we get to experience that through mezcal and there's two ways to think of mezcal and really i I often refer to it as the historic way which is just anything distilled from the agave plant in Mexico. So tequila is a mezcal, and you can see old labels of Cuervo and Herradura where they reference them as vino de mezcal or things of that nature, where mezcal is actually on the label. These are sort of uh, 250-year-old companies in Mexico. Uh, so we have mezcal to think of in that way, and then all agave spirits. But then on the flip side, there's all these unique and independent identities. So you have, you know, the state of Sonora and they have Bacanora, other parts of the state of Jalisco and they have Ricea. Uh, Often people are thinking about if if, if they're having, if they're scratching the surface of Mezcal, they're thinking of Oaxaca and it's okay to think of it as Oaxaca first, but Mezcal is, is found everywhere in Mexico. And the, the, or the formal use of the word is including now 10 states, including Oaxaca and other states. So it's a big landscape. 
you know, I guess to express that point even more, I, it's all of the, I say it with such passion because it, it's really inspiring to me. Um, but if you think about all the sort of denominations of origin, whether it's Bordeaux or Napa Valley or, you know, Camembert cheese, um, a statistic that kind of puts things in place a little bit, Mezcal as a DO has the largest by far geographic area coverage. It has the largest number of certified producers and the cool, exciting part on top of that, it has the largest number of uncertified producers. So there's so many individuals producing and there's so many places to see talent. And we as a market and what as a consumer said, you know, we're, we're so far along from 15 years ago of where mezcal as a category has evolved and it's really evolved a lot, but just imagine there's so many more producers and people and varieties of agave and things, other things that um, haven't been experienced yet. So there's still, there's still so much more. You know, one thing I love about the bowl. So we're talking about our bowl is all mezcal and pozzoli festival. That uh, is our, it will be our fourth year in, in New York City this fall, but we're also going to our first year in Denver, which is March 30th, and our second year in Boston, which is April 12th. And the website will be updated and everything. It's bolazole.com. But one, one thing, you know, like distributors are kind of the backbone of just quality and, and follow-up, and, and they really do the, the work of, of of all these brands. And but when we're working in restaurants and bars, the unsung heroes. Yeah, but I'm trying to say is, if we, if you're a buyer, like I was the, a buyer of my own restaurants, you really get spoiled. You you always get access to the best, the good stuff, you know, and whether it's beer, wine, and, and spirits. But um, w- when you're a consumer and you go to these events, we found a really neat connection with a specialty retail shops, and I, I think the hardest thing oh, for me is so because many. I've been in the yeah. industry it's really hard to go to a, a retail shop and, 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 and find your way through it. Um, all right. You want to just mention a couple of the, there, there's a, there's a retailer in Brooklyn and a retailer in Boston that we've been working with and, and what's special about them and what are some of the things we should mention some brands that, that are definitely top shelf that, that represent each of these different um, types of spirits. You know they're 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 two amazing retailers, and they're they're, they're special in in somewhat different ways. We're talking about Dukes in Brooklyn, and the Dukes Dukes Liquor Box and Gr- Greenpoint. Dukes Brooklyn. Liquor Box. Yeah. Thank you. So, and they're not not to leave out anybody else, but we're partnering with Dukes Liquor Box, and what their approach is, you know, it's a tiny shop. And their approach is very much about curation, curating. So when you go into their store, you're seeing their a reflection of these individuals as people, their palates, their passion for stories, and they're they're kind of filtering through. They don't have room, or the and I imagine they don't have the interest to have everything in stock, you know. Uh, so. So what you're getting there is their, their lens, and I what another and one of the things I I like all that about them, and on top of that, what I like is that I think they're moody. I think they change they change what they carry frequently because they want to change what they drink, and I think their clientele <laughs> is is like that. So they're like, okay, cool, we've been working with this, and let's switch to that. So in terms of what are you going to find on the shelves? shit go and i do not know like what's there yesterday and tomorrow could really be different and in, in a really cool way so um but i guarantee you everything they have is going to be awesome social go to social yeah well okay social wine in boston i have a partner there uh they're they're very much i guess in in, in ways they're similar they're very, they're both very much community oriented stores they are very involved in their neighborhood both of them and social wines is a bigger store they do a little bit more like a some of maybe um permanent uh sort of placements on their shelves 
Uh, but anything that you might want that is batch related or you're looking, you, you've read somewhere that, um, that, that you heard about this special release from this producer somewhere online, both of them would be your uh, ideal spiritual guides. Yeah, Eileen at her um, Social Wines in South Boston, she's really expanded uh, her agave section. Um, Big time. Yeah. yeah. And she has a, she's got another, I think she's working on another shop or something like that. Uh, we'll, I'll probably find out more of those details in, in, in April. Oh, yeah. Well, then just like, the, tell us about a couple of brands, you know, that, that are part of Bulls Old that, you know, you, you, we've, we've been able to get at those retail shops. You know, a Gamezcal, a Top Shelf Tequila, Ooh. a Recia, and a Sotol. Okay, well, you know, without if I if I if I'm not saying who you are, please forgive me because I love you all. Uh, but you know, I guess some hot shot tequilas right now that I'm very much um, excited about. Uh, in addition to the what I would call OG, you know, foundations of the category, maybe a foundation of the category would be Tapatio and Fortaleza. And some of the new newer brands of tequila that are coming out that are, poof, that are something uh, like traditional methods, bold flavors, unique between batches, uh, like um, Amatitena and Lalo and Don Fulano and many many others. So the, the the thing about tequila, and we could go this like certainly a separate call or another rabbit hole, is that. If you don't already know, there's a lot to learn and a lot of things that I might not be inspired with in the market that have the label tequila. That all being said, on the inspiring side, on the maker side, the, the real beautiful side of tequila, that is also growing. There's more and more options. And we hope to be a, pl a platform for those kind of producers at Polizol. So. Since, you know, I got to know you through through Bolzol. Before that, way back in, I think, 2016, Danny Menya and I did a, a Mezcal and Barbacoa event in Manhattan. I, I was there, too. Yeah. I, I think I was trying to do Mexican beer, and I, I kind of unloaded some... Un, some bunk, Al Allende. <laughs> like a plastic... Well, no, the beer was good. It was the sort of the disposable kegs were a big failure. Do you remember that? Like all these, yes. yeah. So yeah, I did. We and we did. We did have. We did have beer at the event, but that was that was it my was first difficult. my first real introduction to. I think we might have had twenty different mezcals at that event. Um, I want to want to ask you is how, how did you? Chefs too. Yeah, like, but how do you go and and so when when we did the first bowl as all, you'd had over twenty tables of different spirit companies, yeah. whether it was importers or distributors. Um, how did you? First of all, I couldn't believe that there were so many quality ones. You know, second of all, again, going back oh, to a more. going there's back more. to a retail store, you know, just sorting through the shelves yourself. How did you pick them? You just mentioned a couple of these authentic tequilas. I mean, you know, it's like I try to roll I I, I try to I'm, I basically live in the circles that I identify with. So, oh. as I'm running around for the past 15 years working in the market, and presenting so uh, mezcal and ricea and sotal and these things, you know, the people that I run into with the same kind of market access or nerdiness or budget, we all sort of are in this independent small world. And then we become friends and we cry on each other's shoulders and all of those uh, beautiful things. So, they became the people I know. So they're the first people I reach out to and they're the things that I'm interested in drinking and sharing. So it all kind of makes sense. You know, it, it, it's a natural way of things. And then, you know, you, you get introduced to other people by other people. Again, we tap resource back into our distributor reps our distributors. And they're like, Hey, you know, we represent this brand. Would you like to speak to them? Of course, let's, um, make an introduction and again our distributors are also kind of 
you know, they tend to curate by their nature alongside us. You know, I remember when I first started Fidencio and was starting to reach out to distributors to find to find market access. Nobody had mezcal. There was no but no brands in the market. So the people who took a flyer on us were really bootstrappy, go get them, passionate people. Well, now they've grown to very successful, medium sized, you know, important distribution. So the brands that they pick up, they sort of reinforce that. They continue that DNA that they've built themselves. So they become a little bit of a another resource for the event. Sure. Oh yeah. So you did tequila. So let's let's go through the mezcal category. Um, what are what are some okay. other brands that we could should look out for? Mm, oh my God. There's there again so many. You know, I, I, I like when I started, there were I don't know six artisanal mezcals in the United States, and there's a couple of junky industrial ones. And now I think there's easily more than three hundred. So the list goes on and. And on, uh, Flor Des- Desierto is really, um, uh, really doing a great job with Sotal, as as many others are. Sotal is a category of traditional Mexican spirit that's not from the agave plant. We have La Higuera at the event and Fabriquero, and that category is growing. There's now celebrities getting involved, so more people might catch with uh, wind of it, and so on. But th- that's a it's a traditional spirit can be made like in a more industrial way or a more traditional way, like a traditional mezcal. It's made from the Sotal plant in English. That's called desert spoon. You get a lot of typically more earth and vegetal notes, but there's a huge spectrum of types of Sotal plants and then terroirs and maker preferences and influences and all those great things. So that's what that's a, a, a place to talk. Uh, I really, really love like uh, we have a couple of like really cool curated type of brands. So there's like I guess you could think of them as like independent bottlers like you would in the Scotch world. But they, there's a bunch of that in in the mezcal and uh, Mexican spirits world. Maguey Melate is one of them. Uh, Malbien is one of them. Gusto Historico and on and on. There's a bunch of brands doing cool things that way uh and then we have like category leaders of categories that most of you might not have yet heard of like microscopic categories but actual categories like la venenosa for ricea and uh balacan for tushka and uh and then of course the mexican rum scene the artisanal mexican rum most people some people may know that Mexico on the Caribbean makes a lot of rum. Bacardi has a big factory there. There's a lot of sugar cane. Why wouldn't there be? It's part of this whole Spanish kind of Caribbean connection there. Um, but we see, you know, maker rums, terroir rums, things that would kind of give us more of a sense of being like a agricole rum in Martinique or Cachaca. And there's Beautiful, beautiful things coming out of Mexico with that, and uh, and many more. Bacanoras, UA being one of them, Rancho de Bua, and we're seeing more brands of Bacanora. Bacanora is the agave spirit or the mezcal, if you will, from Sonora, Mexico, just south of Arizona. Pro tip on that, you know, um, kind of like New York, you could drive two hours and uh, get a uh, really awesome. Philly cheesesteak, but you know, they were, if you could be in uh, Tucson, cross the border, and uh, in a quick drive, get to a lot of Bacanora producers. So when you go to bars in Tucson, feel free to ask your bartender, do you have any maybe smuggled Bacanora <laughs> in, your, in your house? And you might get lucky that way, you know? Uh, so um, it's interesting how there's the different connections to Mexico within the United States varies a lot. So we're talking about New York pit, talking about Boston, we're in Denver, but you know, our country is big and it's different things in different places. So Tucson's a really good place to, to drink Bacanora. Wow. Well, good you know, chance. back back to being a distributor or importer and, 
you know, traveling the country. I remember during COVID, um, you you and your wife drove across the country, and you had some revelations. Uh, I think tell me about the the tasting you did in Montana, uh, and the interest and in, and in turnout in mezcal. Well, all right, yeah, we um, we were lucky that during pandemic we had roof access, so we got to stretch our arms and legs a little bit. <clears throat> being in New York City. But what we didn't have is that, you know, beach house to really leave or that mountain house and stuff. So come August, we were like, okay, we're out. We packed up the car. We, uh, I will say a shout out to REI because everything was um, purchased online that we needed. <laughs> but we had about a three hour session with one of their product advisors teaching. So Courtney knew how to camp. I've never camped. I'm from Brooklyn. I, uh, I don't, I, I would have liked to think I'm like, I, I would do it, but this is all new to me. So she really hooked it up and spent a lot of time with us. Anyway, we backed up the car and we thought we we're going to camp and hike all around the country. And, and we sort of did, except going through the East Coast and getting, until we got past Colorado, we basically were, um, we were mostly with friends and camping in people's yards and things like that. Uh, but then we got to Wyoming and, uh, and then the thing started opening up. So when we left, you know, I, I didn't really care about getting business cards or it wasn't at all about making business, but before we left and leading up to that period, one of the things that we pivoted during the pandemic was reaching out to buyers in retail because that's what they were starting to boom and everyone's new business is different. So we started doing these, you know, 30 ml, these one ounce, two ounce tasters in little glass bottles, printing up labels. So we got really familiar with that. So what Courtney and I did on the way out is we took all the stuff in the portfolio and all these different expressions that we had and spread them out through a couple of cases of these um these um one ounce bot glass bottles and we wrote our uh we printed labels and printed them with our with what it was and then what our our phone number or email or whatever it was kind of like kind of like a glad hand in uh sort of business card and then you know we're driving around and you know we've had all these different you know, so it turned out to be a really cool way to share and connect with people. And then we get sort of later in the part that we're in Montana, we're going into Missoula and we weren't really there to be in Missoula. Missoula was, we were going for lunch and then we were going to, you know, one of my bucket list places, which was Glacier National Park. I've always wanted to go. We And it was one, one of our sort of where we spent up, we were actually got an Airbnb there as opposed to camping which is good because it turned out to get really cold there in August. So we get, uh, so Courtney's like on Google looking for, a, you know, a nice place to drop in. So we found this Mexican restaurant and um, it's called the Camino. And we walk in there and it was like, really like, like walking into, you know, a really big smile. We're like, wow, look, this is a serious mezcal collection. So we're seeing things that we haven't seen anywhere. In Montana, it's a control state. It's a small market. It's complicated to get product in there. So it was very unexpected for us. We hadn't seen anything like this so far. So talk to the owners. Long story short, Saturday morning, like a week later after Glacier, we came back with the plans to do this. Uh, and we did a staff training. And be because we had all these minis, we did. We had enough product for everyone to taste through, and we just did a deep dive in things in general. Of course, we we're presenting brands and the makers, but it was it was really about like just a kind of a deeper experience. And what was crazy, or it was really beautiful for us. Of course, we're doing something that we love to do during pandemic, and that was unexpected and totally special. Well, we're doing it in a place where nobody goes to. Like there is no, if you're a brand owner, go to the places that people go to less because or it, 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 they're, 
they were thirsty, they appreciated. And that's the kind of experience we ran in there. So this was a the only time we would work it was like a 9.30 in the morning on a Saturday morning to do this staff training. And I'm thinking if I did that in New York, I'd get between, I don't know how many people there. But one and 1. 1.2 people. <laughs> right, right. You know, every, you know, and there was like 43 people that showed up and all of them were at the edge of their seat. And I still have like personal vibes with people from that experience. So that 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 was um, one of these like pandemic moments that were just very cool. Wow. That, that's a great spot. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. There's a reason when you think of Wisconsin, you think cheese. Cheese is a huge part of Wisconsin's history and future. In Wisconsin, the state of cheese, the tradition of cheesemaking excellence began 180 years ago, before Wisconsin was recognized as a state. Immigrants traveled to settle in this lush, green hills of Wisconsin, bringing their cheesemaking traditions with them. These storied skills combined with the freshest milk available created a cheesemaking culture that is uniquely Wisconsin. Wisconsin's 1,200 cheesemakers, many of whom are third and fourth generation, continue to pass on old world traditions while adopting modern innovations in cheesemaking craftsmanship. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Hey, 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 welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host. It's our 14th year, and uh, come out and support heritageradionetwork.org. Become a member, heritageradionetwork.org. Uh, we're talking about Bolazol, which is a, the Mets column Bolazol Fest that's in New York, Boston, and now soon to be Denver um, with uh, Arik Torin, one of the co-founders. Full disclosure, I'm, I'm also one of the co-founders, and uh, Danny Menia, who's a Great chef and mezcal porter and restaurateur um, had a had a and quote, book author and book author made in Mexico. He had a quote. I want to just read this out loud because it it says a lot about what we're talking about. Um, the great spirits of Mexico. Danny says the beauty of it is that it's such a clean spirit and there's so much flavor in its base form. The agave plant is so complex and there is nothing that compares to mezcal when it comes to how crafted it is. The spiritual connection that those people have to the plant and to the land and knowing how important it is in their livelihood and their culture. Uh, these are just some things. So he's talking about land and plant and culture. Um, do those things resonate with you, Ark? Absolutely. I think we were just kind of talking about that. And and yes, big time. And, and honestly, it's not... It's not I'm in the world of Mexican spirits, um, but, you know, you give me that same experience in South America, in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe, and I'm at the edge of my seat or anywhere else for that matter. You know, so, yeah, the makers, the history, the plant, the earth, uh, the practice, uh, I'm in. Yeah, it's authentic. You know, it's kind of like when you go to a, a natural wine event. And someone tells you, you know what, we're making wine the way our, our grandparents did. Um, and it starts with the earth. Hey, let, I want to go back again. So I, I know that you started in the restaurant industry, your industry pro, general manager, all that. How did you get the the Mexican spirits bug? What what what, what flipped Ooh, that switch for you? Because um, you could have been a wine rep. You, you could have been a lot of things. Well, it's kind of like a two-stage thing. Yeah, I think, um, okay, some aha moments, but this is like pre-career. But if you look, if I think back on it, they did, they did set some tones. Uh, okay, so I'm in college. It's probably like summertime in like 1991, and we're all home. And I'm with probably friends and their friends from school, and it's probably too many people in a really – you know, ridiculous bar in the Upper East Side, whatever that may be. And then there was a promotion for Patron. And I didn't know it at the time, but this was when Patron 
was bef way before they were what they were. And they were produced by Siete Leguas and they were made at the original distillery. And they really were one of the greatest spirits made. And there was shot girls giving out shots, pouring it out and I'm drinking it. And of course we're happy to get free shots. And, but I'm remembering that the tequila was special. It was different. And jump to like 1998, 99. Uh, well, actually before that, uh, I've had a few experiences, but then I, I was working at a place and the, 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 the preferred staff drink was El Tesoro Reposado. Again, legendary brand. And this was at a time where their production was um, from really, really at its, what is still now considered highly, the, some of the most te collectible tequilas there are that we were just drinking them for the regular price. And we were just like, wow, we don't know why it's so good, but it's so good. And there's just nothing else that we know about that's like that. So that was really cool. And then uh, flash to like when I was traveling in Oaxaca and I'm like, okay, I, I know about how things are made. Let me go visit some mezcal distillation. I'm already a big tequila lover. But I don't really know about mezcal. I don't know. You don't see anything in our market. Imagine, you know, 2005, there's nothing that said what type of agave was in the plant. What's the name of the maker? What's the practice? So there were a couple of good mezcals available, but it still was a little bit mysterious, more than a little bit. So you go there. And again, as soon as I see the production, I'm like, oh, there's a pit oven. It's wild fermented in, in, in open wooden bat, vats with the fibers. These guys are milling with a Tahona stone or hand crushing it. Okay. Oh, you could use any type of agave? You don't, you know, that makes sense. Like, imagine if the wine world was just one variety of grape. That would be torture, you know? So that was all that moment in like 2007 when these, I, I started to see that. And then tap into it. And that's when I started to pursue it. And yeah, that was that was that moment. That was the beginning. Well, that's neat, man. Well then jump jumping up to yeah. you know the work we've done together. You know, you mentioned that deep dive of of into all these different mezcals at the bar in Missoula, the staff tasting. Mm. The, the, that's what I love about Bolzol. You know, also when I first started 30 years ago, going to uh, spirit and wine tastings with guys like Dan Lerner from Skernick Skirm Wines, you know, we'd go in with a tasting glass and go down all the tables and, and try, you know, over a hundred different, different, different products. Um, describe to people what, what that, what it takes to get those products in, in an event. I mean, what, I can't mm. believe the, the lineup. It, I don't even know how to describe it. What, what is the spirit experience at Bozo? That's the question. We're, we have good music and good lighting, but we keep the music a little bit lower because we want, to, in order to really get the full experience of this, it's really, you have to want and experience the stories of the people that are sharing it with you, that are pouring for you because they're so passionate about it. Everybody there is pulling out their best. So we typically have about 20, 25 tables of either brand table or importer table. And at the end of it all, we're, we're pouring at about 150 different sips, all of which are just beautiful spirits. So you get to go in and go as deep as you can imagine and hear it from the people that you want to hear it from. Those people are the ones that we talked about these great retailers. Part of what makes them great is they go out on their own and they learn about things. But they're part of what makes them functional is that these people go into their shop and educate them because that not everybody has time to do everything at all times. So we have a group of, in one room of all these people that are passionate about their brands, about their makers, about the category, and then they're pouring sips of it. And then the crazy part is that because of the internet and you know there's 
legal and open, comfortably legal workarounds in that we now can offer everything that's poured at the event to be sold uh, and ordered for retail. And we offer that at a discounted price. So if you go to the event and you try something, you could go in that moment to the retail partner and then get it at a discounted price. And that, that, that's, it's, it's a beautiful full circle. I want to mention Baker Wine and Spirits, our retailer in, in Denver. They're amazing. Um, you, uh, again, beautiful people. You know, if you want to uh, listen to, uh, you know, lo-fi vinyl while you're shopping, you're going to give you this kind of experience. More people that are passionate about wine and spirits and everything. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned, we talked about Dan Lerner as an inspiration and, as, and we both have personal connection to it, but we have like Daryl Wyatt in Denver, John Spursett in, in Boston, uh, David Dong in New York and uh, Justin Lane Briggs in New York. These are equally amazing people carrying the torch, carrying uh, their portfolio, but, you know, they're going to, tell you every awesome competitor that they are proud to drink and they enjoy all of that. So all of these folks out there, there, there's more of them. There's, there's, there's great people that are current and uh, or current resources to tap into that are carrying that torch. So we're lucky. No, that's, that's amazing story. Um, Back to Denver. So you wanted to, do the event in Denver. Uh, who are some of the connections yeah. there? Like, you know, they're one part of this event are, are the, the chefs who cook pozole. Um, do you want to give us a preview yeah. of, of some of the, what will be at Bolazole Denver on March 30th? Yeah. You know, Bolazole, the name, I think maybe it was Danny's wife. That was where we landed the name June, but you know, this came about, because of the food and the culture and the, and the experience of the food, you know, what is bowl of soul is kind of, it comes from this feeling of a bowl, bowl of soul, uh, this brothy entree, um, nourishing food. So we're nothing, this event, we have been talking about spirits and my, my origins, but this event is so much about food and the chefs. So, um and 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 the history of that food so um we will have some seminars at the event from some brands but also a, a pasole seminar so if you're able to come and tap into that we really that's a new feature that we're adding this year um but yeah pasole is this rich brothy food there's different traditions or different styles that are historically identified to different parts of Mexico. It's a beautiful platform for creativity. And over the years, we've gotten some really great examples of, of that tradition, but also of inspiration. Uh, so uh, in Denver, uh, it's early on. Uh, we're we're going to have um, Jose Oliva from La Diabla, um, Dana Rodriguez from... Uh, Cantina Loca, uh, El Chingon. Uh, I don't have the list in front of me, but and we'll have about fifteen chefs uh, or restaurants. We're gonna have a in the backyard uh, a trompo of al pastor, so we'll have a traditional al pastor. We've done that in New York too. That New York is really sort of where we got that idea. That was um, um, Julian Medina, Julian yeah. Medina of Tolawache, and he did. Oof, a, 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 possibly the best alpha story I've ever had in my life was from his spit in at our event. I was just blown away, uh, and um, yeah. So to to name a few, Re- really, um, there's going to be a, a certain flavor. E- each city this event in has a different flavor, and what is it about Denver? Like Def- Denver, you know that part of America used to be part of Mexico, <laughs> you know, um, wh- wh- what's the Mexican or Mexican American flavor in, in Denver? It runs deep. That's different it, it, from the East coast. Well, I grew up in Brooklyn and, um, if, uh, you know, I, I, as a Jew of immigrant parents, 
from deep Brooklyn, you know, there was a couple of things that I had to grow out of my ignorance. So I didn't, I thought if you, if you believed in Jesus Christ, that meant you were a Catholic. I didn't know about any Protestant or Baptist or any of that. So that one moment learning experience. And then I didn't know from anything other than Puerto Rican growing up. Like I had never met anybody else until later. And they're like, because my neighborhood was connected to the Puerto Rican neighborhood. There was no Dominicans. There were no Mexicans. So now where we are now, we have so much more of diverse Latin community in, in New York. But that was never the case in Denver. If you were Latin, it's Mexican, you know. Just Spanish speaking origin, it's Mexican. It's still, it's like there's a huge multi generational uh, Mexican community here. And I, I don't claim to uh, know it well. I'm learning it and it's, I see it. You see it though in places like that you typically, you see, I see more of in Mexico than I've ever seen or never have seen in New York with the type of uh, pastry shops or, you know, dressmaker shops for quinceaneras or. Oh, or, or our piñata shop. So we had this idea. This is thank God, thanks for Denver. We had this idea to do a piñata in the shape of a piña. You know, the core of the agave plant that, <laughs> after it's harvested, looks like a pineapple. And we did it for well, we 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 we, we found this woman, and um, her name is Dana, and she's from Mexico, and she's got in this very remote neighborhood. She has this piñata shop. So Courtney and I, my wife and I, we've been talking with her and working with her. She took her time. She was in, kind of inspired by it, and she nailed it. So that we've used those piñatas at our uh, house and tales of the cocktail in New Orleans this past year. And for these events and our after parties, we're going to have piña piñata feature from her. And if you're in the Denver event, she's going to have a table, and you can come and meet her. And um, it's Piñateria. That's the name of her business. Very simple. And she, um, inside the piñata, of course, because we're in the booze world and we get to play around a little bit, adult world, these are adult piñatas, you know, they're filled with um, little plastic bottles of, you know, spirits, if you're lucky enough, or maybe some traditional Mexican candy. So, come, you know, make, if you come to the event and you want to have a little extra fun, please come to the after parties afterwards uh, and we'll be hitting some, some piñatas. Well, good. Well, listen, Ark, uh, check it out, bozol.com. Uh, but I just want to thank you for coming on and uh, doing this profile. Um, I do think that the, the people that work in our industry are really important to all the good things that we like, you know, drinks and food and hospitality. So it's nice to know a, a little more about you. Absolutely. And um, shout thank out to you. everybody, those distributors out there and, I guess we should once again mention those retail friends, uh, Duke's Liquor Box in Greenpoint, mm-hmm. Brooklyn, Social Wines in South Boston, and, and Baker's Wine and Spirits in Denver. And they're all, they're, they're the way to get uh, spirits that you can taste at our events. But, but for beer, lastly, I just want to say yesterday, I, I got to see my friend, Mr. Toshi Kayuchi, who, who I knew as the, as the guy who made Hitachino White Ale. Uh, which was a mainstay of the early days of my Jimmy's number 43. And I want to shout out because uh, he's launched, it's been 10 years in the making. I think there's a 10 year age involved. He has a Japanese whiskey line, Shinoburo, uh, the Kayuchi, and it's coming to select, select places. Um, What was neat about this whole industry thing, again, is going to an industry tasting, seeing the distributors, uh, seeing folk that that you know, there was a guy from Death and Company and Rain's Law, Rain's Law Room who who actually bend a bend a bowl So it's a great circle. And um, I did drink beer. I had Hitachi no Red Rice <laughs> and I had the Veil, a New England IPA, um, both on tap in an amazing bar as is, which is a good brew seal bar. And um, we'll be talking more beer and we'll be talking good brew seal and rye and a lot of things uh, that the next next month and in particular the craft mall conference in maine march 16th to 18th so thanks so much for listening thanks to Arik torn for joining me here on bolazol.com and big shout out to liam who's our engineer today on heritage radio network i'm jimmy carboni we'll catch you next time on beer sessions radio all right Arik, thank you brother thank you brother beer sessions radio is powered by simplecast
Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.